Hi everyone, uh, my name is Pat Kirkby. For those of you I haven't met yet, um, I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Land and Food and today I'll be talking to you, uh, just giving you a, a brief overview of my project which we, is asking uh, whether there is a place for culture in community-based adaptation to climate change. Uh, so my project is being supervised by Elaine Stratford, uh, Pete Leaf and Rowan Nelson. Um, apologies for those who aren't here today. Um, and also Dr. Cathy Robinson, who's a geographer from CSIRO. Um, so my project's supported by a scholarship uh, through CSIRO. Um, and I also have a local partnership in Bangladesh where my field program is through the International Centre for Climate Change and Development. And I've been doing some work there as a visiting researcher. Um, I've also um, have some support from the Arts Environment Research Group for a component of my study, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And I'm engaged uh, with a community called the Rakhine in coastal Bangladesh. And I'll touch more on that later too. Uh, so in terms of a little bit of a background context of who I am and why I became interested in this subject area. Um, so I originally did uh, a Bachelor of Science uh, with honours graduating in 2009 here at UTAS, um, and at that time I majored in Earth Sciences and I had a minor in Geography and Environmental Studies. Um, so I went on to work for a little bit as an environmental consultant and as an environmental geologist, um, but then I kind of moved into working uh, with not-for-profit initiatives um, in international contexts, so uh, in Bangladesh, Vietnam and Triangra, where I was leading projects related to uh, in themes of environment, climate and energy, and sustainability. Um, through that time, I managed to uh, do a Master of Environment at uh, Melbourne Uni, majoring in climate change, um, mainly by correspondence, and then moved back to Tassie late last year and got started with my PhD. So I'm uh, only about eight months in so far. Um, so a lot of my work uh, in Bangladesh, Vietnam and Sri Lanka was around adaptation to climate change and uh, working with uh, what are conventionally deemed to be uh, vulnerable communities. Um, so I became quite interested and focused on this, um, this discourse of climate justice and this is a, um, to kind of sum that all up, you could say that those most vulnerable to climate change are often those with the lowest capacity to adapt and cope. Um, and these are typically poor and marginalised peoples uh, living in developing nations. Um, uh, further to that, uh, these communities typically have very low greenhouse gas emissions, uh, especially on a per capita level. Um, so out of that kind of discourse, uh, there's a, a um, kind of responsibility of affluent developed nations to take account of their historical carbon debt and provide support for adaptation and low carbon development in um, such vulnerable areas. Uh, so the aim of the CBA community of practice is to reduce the vulnerability and strengthen the adaptive capacity of local communities. And CBA focuses particularly on those communities most vulnerable in the developing world. So this uh, community of practice emerged a bit over 10 years ago, uh, mainly out of the development sector. Um, and there's a, a huge opportunity to finance this kind of work, um, particularly through um, funding, funding streams specific for adaptation. Um, and these are now kind of on the multi-billion dollar scale through kind of um, the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change, but also through bilateral and multilateral institutions such as the World Bank. Um, and there's now thousands of such projects in existence. So community-based adaptation uh, projects, CBA projects, uh, have their approaches localised, participatory and community-led, and they've got a strong emphasis, um, a bottom-up emphasis. So they start with the expressed priorities and needs of communities, build upon local knowledges and capacities, as well as uh, uh, practices where successful of adapting and coping with climate-related hazards. So in terms of uh, where I was going with my PhD, um, I'm informed not only by my personal experiences of working with those communities, 
and in those areas, but also from the theory of um, kind of bringing together culture, cultural dimensions of climate change adaptation. And this was summarized quite nicely in an article by Ajay Tao in um, Nature Climate Change, uh, where they brought together a number of studies on the psychological, cognitive, normative, you know, values around uh, climate, ch uh, in terms of climate change. And they sum that all up as saying, society's response to every dimension of global cli climate change is mediated by culture. So culture mediates adaptation and pathways from everything through, uh, from identifying risks and perceiving risks through to making decisions about adaptation responses, uh, the means of responding and the outcomes of those adaptation um, interventions is all mediated by a local culture. So my PhD is kind of situated at this nexus between climate change adaptation and culture in the context of the CBA practice. And in terms of planning my research, I kind of came up with four key questions that kind of um, uh, amount to that um, problem context. Um, so the first is how does culture influence adaptation pathways and outcomes and how does this look within uh, a local community level context such as CBA that, that CBA would work with. And then I moved on to how is culture addressed in the theory and practice of com community based adaptation and then kind of a bit more pragmatically how can CBA work within this lo the local cultural context to improve adaptation outcomes and then finally um, is there any role given that culture and the arts uh, are so intertwined, is there any role that the arts can play in meeting the objectives of CBA? So I'll talk about each of those uh, kind of in, uh, in isolation over the next few slides. Uh, so the first question, how does culture influence adaptation pathways and how does this look within a, a, a local cultural context? So my approach uh, was through an ethnographic immersion in a community called the Rakhine. Uh, the Rakhine are a small Buddhist minority group that live in the coastal belt of Bangladesh and they were the first peoples to live in that area. They're now a minority community living in uh, Bengali Muslim society. Um, so they've got a very interesting kind of vulnerability, not just um, based on their geographic environment and, and their environmental and, and climatic context, but also due to their, them being a minority community and, and the marginalisation um, socio-politically and culturally that comes, that comes with that. Also um, their landlessness, um, degree of poverty and, and remoteness, etc. Um, but I became very interested in working with the Rakhine um, because of their strong and traditional culture and their kind of long-standing experience, multi-generational experience of living in that dynamic and volatile kind of environmental contexts in coastal Bangladesh. <coughs> uh, so culture is a, there's no universally accepted definition on, on what is culture. Um, it's quite an abstracted and a vague concept. Um, so I, I've de developed my own framework to analyze and discuss culture in my research. Um, and my framework is called ideational culture and that takes in a number of different cultural forms such as worldviews, values, beliefs, um, motivations and uh, this, this framework asserts that culture is diverse at a local level, it's also dynamic, complex and nuanced and is largely intangible. So in working with the Rakhine and identifying um, cultural forms, I'm focusing on barriers to adaptation, cultural assets and also enabling factors. Uh, then my second question is, how is culture addressed in the theory and practice of CBA, uh, community-based adaptation? And to tackle that question, I've engaged in a, a systematic review and comprehensive review of the scholarly and grey literature on CBA and teasing out, um, uh, using a narrative analysis, teasing out discourses about culture. How is and isn't culture addressed? And my findings here is that CBA is poorly informed by this literature on the cultural dimensions of climate change adaptation. Uh, CBA is stated to work within the local cultural context and build upon local cultural forms. However, these often cited um, statements haven't actually been unpacked in that literature 
and no kind of practical guidance is explicitly given to practitioners about how they can actually enact this. So kind of my conclusion here is that without a more robust understanding of these nuanced influences of culture on adaptation in the context of CBA, that these statements um, such as work within the local cultural context will remain as kind of politically driven rhetoric and not actually something that is enacted on the ground in a CBA project. So moving on from that, um, how can CBA more effectively work within the local context to improve adaptation outcomes? So I'm tackling this by providing um, guidelines for CBA projects and practitioners to proactively engage with the local cultural context. And it's my kind of hypothesis that that can lead to improved outcomes for the local community. Um, so these guidelines would be around mapping the local, context, the lo local cultural context and understanding local um, cultural influences on adaptation uh, and also navigating uh, barriers that exist to adaptation and building upon local assets. Um, so my idea is to use a mixed methods approach using participatory action research uh, engaged uh, to, to build upon the experiences of um, the CBA community of practice um, and also to connect with them as kind of intended end users of this research. Um, and also CBA is by no means the first approach to work with local communities. Um, there's been a whole suite of different um, approaches such as community-based natural resource management, uh, community-based disaster risk management, uh, participatory development that have worked with local communities, work with local cultures. So I'm interested in what insights can be drawn from those bodies of literature and also kind of enriching this discussion using concrete examples from my own ethnographic work with the Rakhine. And the last question uh, is whether um, community arts could play a role in meeting the objectives of CBA. Um, so reviewing some of the literature on participatory arts, community arts, arts-based arts community development I found that uh, these kind of initiatives are increasingly ap being applied as a social change modality in international development contexts. However, such work has largely been under-theorised and under-evaluated. Um, however, community arts can make a serious contribution to addressing uh, contemporary social challenges, of which climate change is obviously one uh, important example. So such initiatives are used to address many salient concerns in international development contexts. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, such programs can be very useful from the point of view of researchers uh, stimulating understanding about both identity and culture. However, in the CBA literature, I couldn't find any cases where community um, arts has been adopted in those modalities. Um, in order to reduce vulnerabilities and strengthen adaptive capacity of those communities. Um, this is just a little bit of kind of preliminary brainstorming. I've uh, reviewed uh, this literature um, and, and the outcomes are reported from different um, arts initiatives and I've kind of used a framework called the Community Capitals Framework which specifies seven different kinds of capitals and then kind of lumped in all the reported um, kind of social impacts or uh, di different outcomes of those programs in these different uh, areas of these different capitals. So based on that, I would say that, you know, these art programs have the potential to kind of engage with and build upon cultural capital, human capital, social capital and political capital in different ways. And um, this is quite preliminary kind of theorising but uh, these capitals in the, the, in the literature, they talk about how these aren't mutually exclusive and they kind of interplay together to, to work for community development or in the concept, context of climate change adaptation for um, community-based adaptation. Uh, so through a small grant through the Arts Environment Research Group, I collaborated, uh, I, I developed a kind of theory of change based on some of this um, theorising and work together with a Canadian artist um, and to, to put this together into a tangible program um, and 
this was um, rolled out with the Rakhine community. Um, so rather than coming in as outsiders and running such a program for the community, we trained up uh, local facilitators um, and basically empowered them to run the programs for their own community um, rather than us doing it for them. Um, we then lo worked with local elders and storytellers um, to, uh, to, to develop some stories about uh, local cultural strengths of their community or cultural assets um, and then participants in these programs would develop their own personalised stories and um, express those creatively using the, the medium of block printing. Um, and then because we were interested in using this for research purposes, um, we conducted an extensive evaluation program and I'm currently analysing um, some of the data and, and the findings from that in terms of kind of addressing that theory of change. And uh, this is the last slide that I'll leave you with, which has just got a bit of a work program um, about, uh, so I'm looking at doing a dissertation by publication. So I've specified different um, journal articles that can address those questions um, and kind of a bit of a um, program for how I'm going to, um, to work towards that. So thanks very much. And yeah, um, any questions, most welcome. As I mentioned, um, not that much uh, theorising has been done on kind of the capacity for participatory arts to kind of create, to meet those kind of objectives of community-based adaptation. But um, as I said in this slide, I'm kind of trying to put together um, some of the findings from different studies. And then I'm thinking uh, in terms of the evaluation of the program, trying to evaluate those different findings under, um, under these different capitals um, on not only an individual level for participants but also for the wider Rakhine community and then broader society. Um, and then obviously because it's a one-off program in each of the different villages, you can't ex expect that to be you know, a transformative social change for the whole community, but you can um, definitely uh, identify whether social capital is being built th through those programs and kind of theorise about other kinds of social change that that's, that's So the community capital framework is, is the theoretical framework, is it? For, for the art program yeah, work. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. Okay. yes one more question. Can you tell us a bit more about what you actually did with the art program, what, what they were doing and what, what, you, what they were getting out of it? Yeah, okay. Um, so, okay, where should I start with that? Um, so we ran three different art programs in three different villages, uh, and we had uh, about 50 people attending all up. And first of all, everyone really enjoyed it. It was and, and found it a very empowering and kind of enriching experience. Only one of the people that attended the art programs had ever used paint before. Um, so that in alone was kind of like a positive outcome. But in a research um, perspective, um, we found a lot of indication of social capital being built. So in terms of building um, community, uh, kind of collective form of identity, um, and kind of social cohesion and new relationships, that was quite important. And for such a community, in terms of adapting and coping and responding to climatic impacts and, and just general kind of uh, development concerns, that, that kind of community cohesiveness and capacity to, to work together and make decisions and take action together is very important in itself. Um, then the kind of focus of the art programs uh, was on, I guess, building cultural, capaci uh, cultural capital and we found that through people kind of telling stories about the strengths of their own culture, that that was kind of like a self-affirmation um, of the strengths of their culture, which kind of 
could mobilize those positive ways of thinking, those positive worldviews, positive values that can contribute to um, their well-being in, in the context of climate change adaptation, just generally building their capacity as a community to kind of deal with those pressures. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Pat. I yeah. think we'll have to stop there and uh, thank you for okay. the presentation. Yeah. We'll move on to palm oil plantations in Malaysia. I'd like to invite Najib Aziz, who would be talking to us about yields, pests, and conservation issues in Malaysia. Thank you. I think I have to move. Yep. Oh. This one? Oh, I think that's yeah. So this one is only for lecturers. Uh, I have to run upstairs and grab. <laughs> really sorry. Like normally, I went upstairs to log out, log in. Uh, Okay, maybe what we'll do is while you do that, yep. we might get on to time yeah, yeah. or something. Yep, while we're okay. okay. Sorry. Sweet. <coughs> okay, Tamilara san would be giving us uh, his final seminar. And this is based on broad spectrum resistance to tuber invading diseases of potato. I hope we can get on to your seminar presentation. I think so. Oops. Good afternoon to everyone. My PhD topic is broad spectrum of resistance to tuber innovating diseases of potato. My supervisors are Associate Professor Callum Wilson, Dr. Robert Shea, Tech, Professor Sergei Shabala from our university. In this topic, in this talk, I'm going to talk about my small background about my PhD and also three research topics, which is broad spectrum of resistance, over superstition, and then genome studies and then I concluded with my outcomes of my PhD work. To begin with background, so in my PhD there are four different topics which is covering with pathogenicity trial and then molecular work and genomic work and also covering with epidemiological work which is identifying a root infection in poverty scab but due to the time concern I'm going to talk about only a three topic, the first three topics. To start with the importance of potato, potato is the third most important food crop in the world after rice and wheat with production of 320 million tons per year. And according to International Potato Research Center, over 4,000 cultivars are cultivable in the, in the world and nearly 100 countries are cultivating potatoes. And it is a highly nutritive crop and also it has a highly protective than other cereal crops. And also, according to the statistics of International Potato Center, next 20 years, the potato cultivation can meet 50% of world food requirement. In Australia, Tasmania, South Africa, and Victoria are the three main states producing potato. And Tasmania is the one of the leading states in producing potato processing, processing potato. And in that, Russell Burbank is the 
is the predominant cultivar and over 60 percentage they are growing in Tasmania and which is really using in French fry industries and other processing sector. However, in Tasmania, common scab and powdery scab of potato cause a huge impact on Tasmanian potato processing industry which brings over $20 million loss every year. Common scab and powdery scab both look similar but the symptoms are the causing by pathogen are totally different which is by common scab is caused by bacteria streptomyces scabby and then powdery scab caused by protozoan pathogen caused by Spongospora subterranea and common scab produces deep lesions on the tuber skin and also powdery scab produces raised scabby lesion on the tubers. In Australia, common scab caused 4 percent yield loss and in the recent find, in the latest finding was that Streptomyces scabby produces a wide range of thiaxtamine which is a phytotoxic compound. It can cause, because of this thiaxtamine, they cause uh, symptoms on the tuber. Absence of this thiaxtamine, they cannot produce uh, symptoms on the tuber. And using this identification, which is applied into the breeding section, and applied this thiaxtamine into the Russell Burbank cultivar callus, and then challenging with the thiaxtamine into the product as a cell selection method, and producing over 500 regenerants, 500 clones from the Russell Burbank, one single cultivar and conducting a several glass house trials and then series of field trial to select the superior common scab resistant line. So in my study, the first focus is to understand the pathogenicity and the breadth of resistance in the selected clones. And we all know that we found that it is a resistant to common scab. And also in my study to test the breadth of other pathogens which is caused by powdery scab and also caused by power fang black scab which is caused by Rhizoctonia solani which is a fungal pathogen, and tuber soft rot, which is a pectobacterium species caused by another type of bacteria. So far, doing the powdery scab pathogenicity trial, two field trials and three glasshouse studies were conducted with selecting first 50 clones, which are resistant to common scab. And also, this is assessment made on based on the tuber, skin, tuber disease surface coverage, and also disease incidence. For the black scurf pathogenicity assessment, I chose only four best clones in three glasshouse trials and also used the three different strains of Rhizoctonia solani. And then again, the disease assessment based on the root infection, stem canker, and tuber disease severity. For the tuber soft rot, I used in vitro selection method to assess the how much of the tuber soft caused by the pectobacterium disease. From this result, we found that common scab which is super resistant, the resistant clones are highly showed 80, 89 or 19 percentage reduced disease only shows 19 percentage disease symptoms on the tuber. For the powdery scab it shows only a 44 comparing with the parent line. For the black scab it shows only 40 percentage comparing the Russell Brown best clone or parent and also for the tuber soft heart it shows only 43 percentage. This is the pictorial photograph about the best clone which is there and then Russell Burbank. So comparing the common scab and then black scab and powdery scab and tuber soft rot. However, some of the pathogens, black scab, it causes another disease which is stolen pruning and stem canker and powdery scab, it causes root infection, root galling symptoms. From my finding, I also tried to evaluate, uh, assess the determine the pathogenicity resistant in the roots, but there is a no significant difference found in the root infection in the powdery scab when comparing to the parent line. And there is no significant infection where found another disease which is also caused by powdery scab. On going to the black scab, and black scab has three, two different kind of other root infection which is stolen pruning and then stem canker. But there is no significant difference found between the parent and the resist resistant line. So, this shows that A380, our best clone, shows the broad spectrum of resistant to common scab, which is 89 percentage, powdery scab 64 percentage, black scab 65, and tuber soft or 51 percentage. But in this finding, we, I concluded that there is no root resistant infection, only the resistant expressed on tubers. In my science study, I tried to investigate based on the defense response and we know that only tuber associated resistant present on the clones. So in this study, I tried to approach what is the mechanism present in the best clone by understanding the physiological 
variants. The tubers mostly grown under the soil and then because of that the tuber skin mostly interact with the soil microbes. So the tuber skin are the primary contact for the microbes and whenever the pathogen or other environmental stress caused to the tuber skin, they started to produce induced defense response which is subrin. So the subrin is mostly well studied about the defense mechanism for the pathogen and in my study I tried to focus what is how the subrin is responding to the pathogen. So in this aim of this study to understand the host defense mechanism by tuber innovating pathogen by investigating the subrin response and also try to determine the mechanism of the resistance between the best clone and the parent line. So try to look at the subrin response to the pathogen. I try to look at different ages of the tubers and which time the subrin is producing higher. And also we used pot mesh system which can be useful to look identify the tuber age and without disturbing the plant growth to tag the tubers at different age and take the different ages of tuber and also look at the internode too because we found that early forming of internode tools are more susceptible uh, early forming of internode tools not internode two early forming internodes are more susceptible to pathogen or disease so in my most of the studies I try to look at that early forming internodes for through histological method that I try to quantify the subrin and also in the tuber peridum I looked at the histological method to quantify the subrin with different scoring system and zero is there is no subrin and following that 10 which has more than 10 layers of subrin. So and also in looking at the histology method and also try to look at the molecular studies to look at how the genes are expressed in the tuber skin and there are three genes which is well documented about the subrin response, subrin candidate gene expression, CYP8, A6833 and STKCF6, POPA and also in further I am trying to look at the signaling pathway genes which is salicylic, jasmonic and ethylene pathway genes to, to connect the link between the subrin expression and the defense gene pathway genes. And this is the schematic diagram about how the candidate gene, uh, can subrin candidate genes are extra involved in forming the subrin genes. The two genes which is STK and CYP which is involving in fatty acid forming fa layers and POP A gene which is involving forming a reactive H2O re production in it acts as in a different pathway to produce POP A gene to form a subrin layer. From my results this is the subrin score. The resistant line shows more subrin in A380, RB8 and comparing with the susceptible line and also when comparing with the control and the streptomyces cabbage treated tuber skin it shows that A380 is highly produced and then pathogen induced subrin response were found in my experiment. In further I'm trying, I also try to look at the thickness of the tuber skin and then found there is a sub pathogen induced film thickness layer were found and also comparing with the parent and then resistant line there is an increased number of peridium layer were found between the parent and the, resi and the resistant clone and this is a subrin candidate, gene, uh, candidate genes and CYP8A63 which is expressed higher than the parent and the same trend were followed in another gene and also PA, which is also significant to parent line which is expressed higher and these three chains are expressed overly expressed comparing with treated pathogen treated and in the field trial we take the superior line and then moderate resistant line and then parent line RBK5 when comparing with parent line that A380 which is resistant line expressed more than the parent line but however looking at the signaling genes all the genes are expressed higher to the treatment effect but there were no significant effect were found between the parent and resistant line. This is salicylic acid pathway genes, the, the first two genes and the second two genes are, or first two is jasmonic and the second two is salicylic and then this is ethylene pathway genes and there is no significant difference were found on parent and then resistant line. So this concludes that over superstition and then high number of film layers in the superior common resistance is the one of the 
factor for the broad spectrum of resistance to the tuber innovating pathogen and we found there is no association between the different signaling genes which are not enhanced by the common scap and there is no significant difference between parents and clone. But using this mutant we can use for the potato breeding to identify what are the subrin gene associated genetic link to enhance the subrin synthesis. In further, I try to look at through the genomic approach to look at using the single, single nucleotide polyformism method to look at the whole genome to identify where the variation happened to form the subrin gene. So, in commercially cultivating potato, the potato which have mostly heterozygous tetraploid nature, which is four copy numbers of chromosome, but this is really hard to identify the genetic nature because it has a four copies of gene. So, Potato Genome Sequencing Consortium, they have constructed a draft gene potato which is a deployed potato genome. So using this deployed, they make it as a baseline for, for re-sequencing the whole genome of the potato. And then they recently found the sequenced 844 MB of genome, potato genome using this double monoploid and then deployed heterozygous potato, potato variety. And this is the recently published in the nature of the, the potato genome with the covering the 12 chromosomes. So I used one of the methods which is single nucleotide polymorphism which can be easily to identify where the changes are happened within the genome. So the single nucleotide polymorphism can easily locate the nucleotide difference within the given genome and it can, it can be used to identify the point mutation or where the changes or deletions happen in the genome and I can use this to try to identify where the changes happen between the resistant and the parent line. So this is the example of chromosome 1 of potato and the SNP markers, single nucleotide markers, they were integrated into the chromosome 1. So in the whole genome we used 803,000 SNP markers to identify, to look at the genome genome modification. So in this aim, in this study, we try to determine the genetic alteration occurred between the common scap superior resistant variant and then parrot reset bank by using genotyping method and using this available genetic map able to link where the common scap resistant clone and the different gene pool are located within that population. So I used three parent which is reset bank one Russell Burbank 3 and Russell Burbank 5, which has a, I selected only 29 clones, which are, which has a different level of resistance to common scab, and also the individual clone where all the samples were, the DNA samples were extracted and run across the aluminum 8K SNP chip method, which has 8,000, 8,000, 8,300 markers, and this is the method that we can look at the difference between where the parents and then resistant lines are changes and this is an example of the genome studio we can identify where the ploidy level are changed within the clones so for example in the middle which is called the heterozygous nature and the next and this one is called a homozygous nature so we call it as which is called as a genotyping calling so trip 4a and then bb and then heterozygous might be aa bb so in this experiment, I found that this is an example of chromosome 1, but I have the whole X results for the chromosome 12. For just showing that this is a chromosome 1, but the changes were marked here in the green color, which is the parent line RBK1, and then text resistant line, which is TC99. The changes were happened in the lower part of the chromosome. This is the centromere, which is marked as a dotted line. And the changes here, the changes were found here, here, but we don't know what the changes are happened by the either might be a homozygous AAA or maybe homo, homozygous BB. So we mapped using that value probability ratio to look at what is the changes happened within the resistant parent line. And our parent line sitting in the middle, which is heterozygous nature, but due to the environmental stress or maybe tax time application, it, it changed the plurality level and moved to homozygous level and this is the resistant line, the parent line and that is the our resistant clone, taxonomic resistant clone but this parent, this is one of other taxonomic resistant clone which shows the poor growth and it shows there is a ploidy level changes here. 
However, my aim of this study is to identify the resistant clone A380, but I couldn't find any difference between the A380 and the Russell Burbank. But other changes, in other clones, I found only 5.52 percentage changes happened. And the, the changes happened in other clones, they are poorly, morphologically they are very poor growth. And then we need a further studies to look at where the genes are changed in the resistant lines. At this moment, we, we sequence that A380 resistant line and also we sequence another moderate resistant line which has more than 850 million base pair level of genes. It is hard to do due to the time concern. Maybe further investigation need to identify the gene locus. So from my study that common scab disease resistant cultivar shows is a successful cell selection method and show it, is, it can be used for the novel breeding method. And we found that over superstition is the one of the mechanism of resistance and it will be useful for molecular based breeding method. And then genome approach study is initiated. Maybe further work need to find out where the common scab resistant genes are located in the genome. So from my PhD, I have published two papers from the first two chapters and also have published a presented my work in the conference, international conferences. So I would like to thank everyone and first I would like to thank my supervisors. They are the backbone of my PhD and they gave me this opportunity to do this PhD and also staff members from Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture, Simplot, Plant and Food Research New Zealand, Department of Primary Industry in Oxfield and Department of Primary Industry in Newtown. They gave me a good support for doing this PhD and also they helped me in all the way. So I can't list out who are helping here, but I wanted to thank everyone for supporting this PhD. Thank you. Notice that with the expressions, uh, it seems to me like when you started from week zero right through to week ten, yep. you've got stronger expressions in weeks eight and ten. Yep. Is that simply a reflection of the maturity of the tumors, or could it be that you are having a down regulation or up regulation at different stages? Was that something you thought about? Yeah, here I showed that only the in effect to the pathogen effect, but sometimes it is inconsistent in expressing the because we don't know that it is present in the soil. We don't know when the common scab pathogen is interacting with tubers. Sometimes it goes up increasing pattern, sometimes it increases within two weeks and then slowly getting down. So it is somewhat inconsistent, but the expression shows for the pathogen at least is stable. Any more questions for time? All right, if not, thanks very much. Thank you.
Really sorry, everyone. Sorry for the mix up. <coughs> so, before I start, uh, if anyone's really afraid of snakes, there's a lot of pictures of snakes on my slides. Oh, good one. Yeah, what you might want to do is to put it inside there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Najib Aziz. So I'm from Singapore and I'm, I'll be talking about yield, space and conservation in small holding management in palm oil plantations in Peninsular Malaysia and how it affects herpetologi herpetological communities. So my supervisors are Peter Mikulan and Emma Farrow. And so the palm oil, Elias Guinensis, came from West Africa and it came to uh, Southeast Asia as a form of an ornamental plant back in the 1800s and since then it has, uh, it has grown exponentially for the last, I think, 150 years to almost now 85% uh, produced in the whole world is uh, by Singapore, uh, sorry, by Malaysia and Indonesia. So the, the reasons for this is because the, it's still mostly used for vegetable oil and, but uh, because of the rising demand for biofuels, there has been an increased uh, uh, spurt of gro uh, uh, growth, uh, increased interest in planting this species. So because it has the highest yields per hec hectare at about 3.5 to, uh, to 4 tons of oil per, let's say per hectare, it, is, it actually beats soybean and rapeseed and other, other type of biofuel plants. So... Uh, Currently, uh, we've been looking at amount, the amount of projects that, uh, that you look at is always talking about large plantations around the world, especially, like I said, in Malaysia and Indonesia. But uh, if you look at the percentage of small holdings that occurs in this country, it's about 33% uh, of the total, total uh, oil that comes out is actually by small holdings, and that's actually increasing. And the total population uh, of... Uh, is almost at a little more than 40%. So, but there's not a lot of work that has been done on small holdings, especially in the biodiversity uh, area. So, so in Malaysia, uh, in Malaysia, there's especially uh, there's two types of plantations, which is your large estate, uh, large estate, which actually lasts. If you go up to Malaysia, you drive around. That's the only thing you can see on on the highways left and right. So. Uh, you can see the vast areas of land that they have, and most of them are monocultures. As, uh, sorry, in our estate plantation is only monocultures, and it's all same age stands. Uh, they have mechanized, and everything is, uh, they have high agricultural inputs like fertilizers and uh, fungicides and everything. Uh, and they have uh, uh, workers that come from uh, other countries to actually work for them to uh, with machines to grab, uh, to get the highest yield as much as possible. Their man management system is totally different also. So like uh, with this oil palm, so they live between, they, uh, they can start producing fruit and you can start harvesting within three years and uh, can live up to 25. So with large plantation, after 25 years, they actually cut down the whole, the old, uh, the old stands and actually replant them into the site. And if you can see, you can see with the pictures why is it so clean. There's no dead from palm fronds and everything. They actually reuse the palm fronds into the mills. So they use it as a, a raw material to burn off to use for industrial. So it's actually, uh, they use a lot of back input into it. Uh, that's why it's really commercial, commercially viable because it is so... You can use almost everything, and they start to use it, like looking at the old stands to make papers and everything. 
but, bec but the problem is it's still large plantations are actually still destroying native natural lands, and that's the biggest issue that we, we've been seeing for the last few years. So as compared with smaller plantations, say they're normally run by family groups, smaller family groups. Sometimes you can have only one person. So I met up in, when I went to, uh, to Malaysia, there was a guy that was managing his own small plantation. So it's a small plantations, uh, uh, by the R, uh, it's defined by anything that is less than 50 hectares and not, any, and not at all government control. But there's two types. So there's organized small holdings, which are uh, normally help uh, uh, government, uh, government actually helps them with uh, uh, training and how to plant them, and in independent smallholders, which actually does everything themselves. So if you can see from the pictures, you can see there's not a lot of mechanized, and uh, uh, there's, look at the palm edge stands, everything grows in different sizes, and most of the places that I've been to when, when I was in Malaysia, once they live at uh, the old palm, palm stands, just are left like that to rot away. And you can see like even on the, f on the ground, you can see the amount of nobody, nobody actually bothers to change anything of the ground cover. So there's no proper roads, no proper what is, uh, amenities. And most of this, as compared to large plantations, which I should have said that uh, have their own mills, these uh, small holdings actually have middlemen or with the, uh, the government assisted ones, they actually go to the, uh, there's one central mill that they actually go to. So the origin of my research, so I started uh, talking to Peter, I think a, few, a couple of years ago, and he said, he suggested me to do palm oil. So we, we started uh, looking at it, and I started to talk to uh, David, and Caroline and started to have a more clearer picture of what I should do. I, it, was start, it started as a totally conservation focus, but since we are joining the schools together, I thought that the thing about conservation that I realized that most of it doesn't work because it's all, always one-sided. We don't think about the farmers themselves, and that's where the extension part is really, really important, that we actually have to include the farmers into the system because if you keep telling, especially with where far, like small holdings, where that's their only livelihood, if you keep telling them, oh, you cannot do this, you cannot do this, nothing's going to happen. So that's where I think that yields is a very important thing to actually to explain to people. Money, ma money matters. Sense. You talk to people about oh, increasing money, oh, they'll actually do it. So like I said, there's a lack. If you look at the literature, especially on uh, uh, conservation, there's, not, there's a lot lacking of small holders. So there's a, my... Advisor in Malaysia, Dr. Badura Zaha, so he's from University Putra, Malaysia. Uh, he's the one that actually also suggested to, for me to look at small holdings and how it actually affects uh, because uh, everyone's been doing large plantations and we haven't looked at uh, small holdings where the, prop, uh, is the, um, the capacity which is actually increasing. And even down to local scale, uh, smaller scale, herpetological communities, uh, there's only Currently, there's only two papers that's out that actually studies about uh, herpetological communities. One, yeah, and most of them are based in Borneo, not on Peninsular Malaysia. You may ask why I use Peninsular Malaysia? Because there's no more expansion in Peninsular Malaysia. They cannot expand any more palm oil plantation in Pen Peninsular Malaysia. So whatever is left there, we, the only thing we can actually do is actually to increase conservation. Rather, there's no way of stopping it anymore. So my aims, or my aims and objectives is actually to look at the differences between the diversity in large estates and small holdings, the management differences between the small holders in relation to diversity, especially when I just basically, I, I was, I'll, I'll take a look at how, like, you know, like with different palm edge stands, you have different type of uh, shade cover, then different uh, amount of ground cover, and also like when they use their palm frond management, some clear away their palm, palm, frond man, uh, palm fronds, and some of them leave it, uh, on the ground, so those type of things and agricultural inputs, and so I just want to take like all these management pro, uh, systems and actually see which actually increases the most yield without actually uh, making them pay more money. So that's so the study site will be in Tanjung Karang, Kuala Selangor, Selangor in Malaysia. It's only an hour of KL, so it's on the on the west coast of Malaysia. So it's been an agroforestry area for the last 100, 100 years. 
but only in the 1980s everything has been converted to palm oil. So it was a peat swarm, uh, a peat swarm area and also a mangrove uh, area that has been converted. So uh, the government actually has uh, tilled the area and filled the area of uh, the peat swarm to actually fill it up. But it actually borders a, a very, one of the largest uh, peat swarm conservation area in, the, in, South, uh, in Malaysia, which is the Selangor peat swarm forest. So this is a site visit, so as you can see that, that's me holding small frogs and a dead snake on the side of the road. So we, uh, there's a, it's, it's teeming with biodiversity, it's just that uh, if this was only a one day visit, we, we actually caught at least 10 different types of species of uh, frogs and one species of dead snake, obviously, on the side of the road. Uh, we saw one more in the middle of the night, but we couldn't. So, but that's, a, that's actually a common species. It's actually an a Indochinese red snake. So, yeah, as you can see, it's been run over most likely by a motorcycle. Small tires, tire marks. All right. The first part of, our, the, first part of the project, I was thinking uh, when I go back, to Malaysia to actually start with farmer interviews and from there we can actually ascertain before we do anything we, we look at the farmers and ask them what are their agricultural inputs what type of uh, do, are they using baited traps uh, um, fertilizer herbicide fungicide uh, fungicide use uh, yeah frequencies because like workforce numbers because everything is different so I want to uh, at least quantify at least some, uh, certain things that we can actually use and to narrow down between all the farmers uh, and see if like certain management methods are more prevalent than others. So like the growing of uh, intercropping of local indigenous fruits like bananas, uh, the native jackfruit is champada, uh, coconuts, pineapples. Yeah, so that's the other thing is also to look at the, what to compare where you in this context yields can only be a certain and uh, by there's two ways by asking the farmers themselves and actually going up to the mills and asking them uh, how much yields is given uh, is taken uh, from each farmer also at the same time we want to look at the percentage of the fruits that are eaten by pests the pests here are there's porcupines wild boars uh, and which is the biggest problem is actually uh, field mice and rats that actually eats the fruits so that's another thing that we'll actually ask, which is the, one of the more important bits of it. The other things that I think that is really important is how the attitudes and actions, because down here, when you see a snake, normally the first action is trying to kill it. You don't really care, especially in Tasmania, where you know almost all of it is poisonous, venomous. So most people, most ordinary people will actually, ah, oh, will try to hit it with a stick or something like that. But so that's one of the things because the perception of people and attitudes because not all snakes are actually equal and not all lizards are actually equal. So I want to know which species are more, uh, you know, they are more likely to kill. So after that's done, after I try to quantify them, may, most likely will, um, most, it will be the field methods. So the first thing will be doing visual surveys, like what I did down at the site visit, just randomized look, walking through a transect and looking through refugia and trying to find all different types of uh, <coughs> animals. Next one is to use artificial refugia. So wooden boards, you can see there's different sizes and different types. So the wooden boards, uh, but that's about 30 cm by 30 cm for smaller animals. Uh, the open-ended PVC pipes has been not been used in Malaysia at all, in Southeast Asia at all. It's actually tying PVC pipes onto trees to look at arboreal species, arboreal species of frogs and lizards. And black plastic sheet, 1.5 meters by 3 meters, these are your, for your big snakes. Field, field methods, funnel traps, and pitfall traps. So pitfall traps is always uh, is being used, uh, is commonly used. But uh, I'm looking at a new, a cheaper version of a funnel trap. We actually judges uses two plastic bottles. So I've been looking on YouTube 
and a lot of other places, they've been using this as a cheaper alternative than paying $30 or $40 for, for a mate. And this is easy. You can do it anytime. You can do hundreds of it. If you want to do bigger snakes, you just have to get, like, go to a tip in Malaysia and just ask them, can I have a number of bottles? So the farmer questionnaire, questionnaire, so the data will be scored on a Likert scale and an, uh, analyzed using a chi-squared for binomial responses like yes and no, and uh, Chris Carl Wallace and Man Whitney for questions with three or more responses. The herpetological span, uh, sampling, species richness, and snakes and lizards will be summarized by using GLMs, generalized linear models, and if we can get enough uh, data, we'll use a PCA analysis to look, look at that. And with logistic regression. Everything will be done in R. So certain expected species. So I've, I've, that I've narrowed down only a few species to put down here, but as I compiled about at least 50 species that most likely will occur in the palm oil plantations. So these are the, this dark-sided chorus frog was the small frog that I was holding and the cricket frog and the banded bullfrog, which is uh, quite, they are quite prevalent in, uh, in disturbed areas. Certain species, if, I'll show you some of the species that are prevalent in disturbed areas. So one of it is the banded bullfrog, the dark-sided crawlers frog. Uh, the common green frog, as being common as it is. And yeah, the rough-sided frog. For lizards, the common garden lizard, versicolor, uh, and you have a lot of this orange bearded gliding lizard. So they have flaps on the sides, you can see. They can actually glide from three to three. They are quite a common species. So, but the giant ones I, I've never seen before, but it seems to be, it occurs in this area. Then there's angle head lizards. But one of the biggest things that I'm most interested in is actually looking at the water monitor, which goes up to about two and a half meters. So two meters. Some well, people eat them. So if it's known in palm pond plantations that the workers, because they actually catch them to eat them, because they're a good source of nutrition. They, they, they don't run very fast anyway. But it that's <laughs> it. Uh, but one of the things that's it's been suspected that they actually eat a lot of rats also at the same time. So I'm really interested in how the monitor lizard actually reduces the amount of pests in palm oil plantation. They are a really common species. You go to Malaysia, you go to Singapore, on the side of canals, they'll be basking there, nobody cares about them. Next part are the snakes. So these are all the smaller snakes. So if you know the paradise tree snake, it actually can, it's one of the only snakes that can fly. So from three to three, so you think snakes cannot fly? So yeah. So it glides from three to three. So this is, a, this is one of the most dangerous snakes in Malaysia. It's the blue coral snake. It's a small species, but it's known to kill more, more people than anything else. Then we go on to the larger ones, which I, I, I'm also more interested in. So your king cobras, if you look, there's, a, there's videos on YouTube showing them in all palm plantations, so they are around. So those are the, that's the biggest venomous snakes. Uh, they can actually, if they stand, they can actually look you eye to eye. So reticulated python is known to eat people. <laughs> Unsuspected, unsuspecting farmers who are sleeping on the, on the job. So, so, but they are really common species. You see, the thing is, they, they are, we don't know what's their diet. And the thing is, uh, especially in disturbed areas, there are not a lot of mammals that occurs around, and we can, and with plantation, there's a lot of pests. So most, I'm trying to, I was just trying to quantify that most likely, this uh, without actually doing any, unless there's a lot of dead animals that I can actually cut up and look at their, uh, what is this? their stomach contents. I want to take a look at if reticulated pythons actually eat more pests in palm plantations. So the proposed outcomes of all this is to, yeah, to do conservation which increases yields for farmers. So uh, it's a, I'm trying to get a win-win situation on both sides of the spectrum rather than only one side. 
Uh, then, like we're talking about evidence of predatory behavior of reptiles that reduces press, and the field management methods that, that comes with it. So this funding, this was suggested by Holger a few weeks ago. He actually asked me to try to do crowdsourcing. So it will be a different thing. So I think a, a number of other universities are starting to, to do it themselves. So this will be something that will be novel. I'm looking for only $5,000 because that's uh, what I, I actually need to do field work in Malaysia. Uh, just as an extra to pay for a, a research assistant. And what we can do actually for with 5,000, if anyone donates maybe like a dollar, you get updates on the project. But if you pay $5 per person, $5, I'll send you a postcard. <laughs> yeah, but if you look at this, I think there's a project up in, uh, that is done in uh, Borneo that actually does it. And they actually send postcards by photographers and what they do. And on-site particip participation by volunteering, if you look at Earthwatch and everything, the people pay money to actually do field work. So I was thinking that may be an option. So they just come, they pay, uh, they, they invest themselves in $500, they get a week with me and trying to catch snakes. Trying to catch snakes anyway. <laughs> All right, so acknowledgments. So Dr. David Parsons, uh, Kerala Mahmoud. Ross Cockery was talking to me about how to get biometric data. <laughs> and Dr. Badru Azaha, which is my advisor in Malaysia. Uh, questions? Questions for Najib? I should stand here. No? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. between animals. And uh, so there's cultural and social things that are apparent in that. Yep. No matter what your findings are, if they're very divergent from those cultural understandings of how the ecology systems work, yep. then you're not, not likely to get much uptake of, of the results. So I'm wondering if you've got thought about any ways of dealing with that in a positive framework. This is, uh, I think, one thing like uh, is talking about the, is it talking about the ext how the extension, how we're going to get personal, because there's only, the thing is, it's only one culture, uh, relatively only one culture of people. They are the Javanese Malaysians that live around that area. So we met a few. So uh, a lot of them, are the I've, one of the things that I was thinking of quantify, most of them are, going to, are actually older age, age groups. So none of them are pretty young. So like their children are not even living there anymore with them. So most of them are doing things on their own. So. One, one of the things that I've been thinking about is actually to look at how that cultural, that age culture around that area and to talk to the, to actually sit down. Uh, they're quite friendly people. I've been there so many times to sit down in a coffee shop in the morning and actually talk to them about how I'm supposed to talk to them. I, uh, I was talking to Michael Hart and he said to me one of the things is actually to talk to their village elder. Uh, and ask them what's their perception also at the same time. Uh, does that answer your question or...? Yeah, but uh, in order to do that, you need the framework as your research mm. rather than treat it as anecdotes in coffee shops. Yep. So you need to include it within a, a, a structure. Okay. So, so um, happy to talk to you. Oh yeah, that would be good. Yeah, uh, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something that for me to update because that's the great thing about this seminar. So I, something that I'm, I haven't put through, somebody can That's the thing, like if time permits, I was thinking to do that. It's the thing, the tricky part right now with large plantations, because a lot of research has been doing, like previously, a lot of large 
plantation has been researched on and everything has been negative, that is harder to actually do work in large plantations. So if that's my other thing, if if it's not working in large plantations, I'm actually moving it to uh, to the natural areas. So comparing small holdings and natural areas. Also, at, at the same time, uh, I forgot to say one thing is uh, with large plantation, they actually started integrated pest management with large plantation, but they actually introduced the American barn owl into the system without formal formal research. So they just <laughs> so there's a lot of American barn owls now in Malaysia. So yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, pred oh there's somebody actually done predatory birds uh, in Malaysia. So I'll I'll be working with Bad Badrul. So he's he does birds. So one of the uh, he's I'm going to get bird data from him. So there's a few rare species, but there's a lot of there's the recent paper was looking at. I'm helping out to do is uh, uh, the diff there's migratory birds that also uh, come down to the area. And because one of the things that uh, one of the research actually says small holdings actually has a higher diversity of birds as compared to large plantations. So that's one, uh, I think that was out only a couple of years ago. So that's the amount of lacking of uh, studies on you know, animals in small plantations. But it seems that because of small plantation, it's uh, more traditional methods, less, uh, less inputs, less fertilizers, and the amount of uh, what is habitat complexity actually increases biodiversity in the area. So that's one of the reasons that I want to take a look at herpetological communities.